in the heart of southern England, Britain's newest national park rises out of the ocean. The South Downs. Its rolling hills stirred William Blake to write the words for the Jerusalem anthem. This ancient land has been shaped by people since the end of the last ice age. As I journey through the seasons, I'll be exploring its rich history, landscapes, and wildlife. Look at this. It's one of the most iconic views on the planet. And I'll be meeting with the people who live and work in England's mountains green. They've got their own place. <laughs> I arrived in the South Downs ten years ago to take up a new post as a parish priest. And the moment I got out of the car, I knew I'd found it. I knew I'd found home. I felt very deeply that this was where I belonged. I've been working here ever since, serving three little parishes at the eastern end of these windswept hills. I spend all my spare time walking the South Downs. It's my passion, and I've come to know them well. They start at the Seven Sisters Cliffs near Eastbourne. Stretching over 100 miles west, they pass through rare chalk grasslands, ancient forests, and flooded river valleys. At their western end, they give way to the ancient city of Winchester. My journey follows the entire length of these hills along the South Downs Way, and it begins close to my home on Furl Beacon at the end of winter. This whole area was once a huge dome of chalk created by the same tectonic forces that pushed the Alps and the Himalayas up out of the ground. And at the end of the last ice age, a huge swathe of meltwater carved out the heart of the Downs, leaving the Thames Valley to the north and here, the South Downs. When man returned after the last ice age 10,000 years ago, he would have walked along this ridge, which is now the South Downs Way, and he must have thought, this is paradise. There was fresh water coming up out of the ground through the chalk aquifers. The rivers would have been full of fish, and the forests which stretched down on the side of these slopes would have been game, and of course there was flint to create arrowheads for hunting. Around 7,000 years ago, Neolithic man began to clear the forest for grazing and to build his first settlements. Evidence of early human existence is laid bare all across the Downs. Some of the most important ancient sites in Britain are found here. The South Downs' rich history, landscapes, and wildlife was finally recognized in 2010 when it became Britain's newest national park.
What makes the South Downs so special is that this land has been shaped by people and that their relationship with it has continued unbroken right to the present day. It's early March and I've come to help local sheep farmer Andrew oh, Barr no. bring the ewes off the hill into oh. the lambing barns. Come on! And the idea is to sound like an old ram so the sheep come to you. That, that's my call from a sheep. Hurts your throat when you've got a sore throat. <laughs> Without sheep, the chalk grasslands that dominate the eastern end of the downs would not exist. Their constant grazing keeps woodland at bay and has done for thousands of years. It's created one of the rarest landscapes on Earth. When I came here, I thought, thought I'd gone to heaven, really. I thought, yeah, just exactly where I want to be. And I'd, I've never actually meant to stay here, but I'm still here. I've been working with Andrew for 10 years at Lambing Time. And we're getting everything ready to go, and uh, you get the sense that everything is um, about to bloom. I started lambing when I was a boy. I was, I was 16. And yeah, it really got hold of me. Um, never loses its wonder, its excitement. Jill. <laughs> yep, she's lambing. You can see all the little white foot. They start to go round in circles. They make themselves a nest. They stargaze. They look up at the sky, and I suppose that's all do, straining themselves to start getting the the idea of pushing the lamb out. Here we go. Here we go. And eventually she'll. She will start talking to the lamb, and the lamb will start talking to her, and those two things get imprinted on their brain, their memory, so they know that little meh, that's my lamb. They all look the same, but they've all got their own meh, and meh, you know, they've all got their own particular individual sound and smell. It's sheep, more than anything, that are responsible for the kind of even green, the even green. It's all right, it's okay. On the hills of the South Downs, and this tradition has been carrying on for thousands of years, and uh, long may it thrive, long may it thrive. Sunlight touches the head of the long man of Wilmington. Recent evidence suggests it was made in the 16th century, but some locals believe it dates back to Neolithic times and that this moment marked the beginning of spring. As the days lengthen, the rich green covers these hills again. But this is a fragile landscape. Only a thin layer of soil, in places no more than a few centimetres thick, covers the chalk. The chalk was formed over 65 million years ago, when this was an ancient seabed. It is made from the shells of microscopic algae called coccoliths, which sank to the sea floor leaving vast chalk deposits made of the mineral calcite. Rain soaks fast into the highly porous chalk, creating a landscape that dries out very quickly. Yet the South Downs is one of the richest and most diverse landscapes in Britain. Open chalk downland is found almost exclusively in southern England. 
The dry soils provide the perfect conditions for some of Britain's rarest and most beautiful plants to flourish. About 30 species of orchid are found here, including the bee orchids. The petals of orchids perfectly mimic the bees, wasps, and other insects that pollinate them. What a beautiful morning. I'm standing here just above the Cookmere Valley and I've come to meet one of the country's leading experts on butterflies, Neil Hume. So this is our version of the rainforest. Um, the diversity of, of plants is, is absolutely fantastic. It's a very, very rich environment and it's so rich because the soil, it's, it's what we call a skeletal soil. It's very, very low in nutrients. So these things are really having to compete. This chalk downland is unique. It is, but it takes an awful long time. This has taken thousands of years to, to form. It's the sheer number of different plants. You know, we're talking 40 species here in a tiny area, a square meter. We're talking 30 species at any one time of butterfly. Get that? Oh, yes. Look. There they go. When you see the Adonis blue, you know it's the Adonis blue. The, yeah, the colour, it's, it's, it would not look out of place in a South American rainforest. They are as good as anything anywhere in the world. If you said Adonis blue, corn bunting, yellow hammer, chalk hill blue, you know you're talking about the South Downs. Absolutely. It's that suite of species which is unique to this landscape. Mm. But uh, the Adonis is... Um, the jewel. It, it's the jewel in the crown. They should be prescribed by the National Health Service. They just bring instant happiness. They raise your spirits. The caterpillar of the Adonis blue butterfly has a special relationship with ants. They protect it from parasites and small predators. In return, when the ants tap them with their antennae, the caterpillar feeds them with a tiny drop of sugar. It's a win-win situation for both. The ancient Greeks used psyche to refer both to the butterfly and the soul. And for me, it's a, it's a, it's a passion. It's, a, it's a, a love, a deep love affair. And it's, a, it's an important connection, I think. <laughs> Across Britain, butterflies are in steep decline and the downs are a critical refuge for them. But 80% of these grasslands have been lost in the last 70 years. During the Second World War, with our supply routes under siege, they were ploughed up to feed the nation in the Dig for Britain campaign. It changed the face of the South Downs faster than at any time in recent history. The impact of the war is evident all across the National Park. Nowhere more so than the Cookmere Valley, close to the Seven Sisters. Look at this. It's one of the most iconic views. In Britain, it's one of the greatest sights on the planet. And it is entrenched, it's seared onto the British psyche. We thought that this was where the Germans might land. This beach was heavily surveyed by the Luftwaffe during the Second World War in preparation for a German landing force. And the architecture of the Second World War still very much remains. There are tank traps here, and on either side of the River Ouse, there are pillboxes. And this whole river valley stretching out in front of me here, this would have been lit 
at night during the Second World War to fool the Luftwaffe into dropping their bombs here rather than on the strategically important port of New Haven, which lies some four miles to the west along the cliffs. Whoa. It is hard to imagine that 72 years ago, a couple of men would have been standing where I'm standing. They would have had a machine gun in front of them, uh, waiting for their worst nightmares to arrive from across the sea. And in all the villages along the Downs, there were local volunteers that formed part of suicide squads called the auxiliary units. And their job was to hold the line in case the Germans invaded. The South Downs has always been at the front line against armies intent on conquering Britain. Its beaches and its hills are riddled with defences. Centuries earlier, in about 870 AD, King Alfred's army marched from Winchester across these hills and established a chain of forts to repel the Vikings and the Danes. But the history here goes back much further. There are the remains of several major ancient settlements along the South Downs Way. This Iron Age hill fort at Sisbury is over 2,000 years old. It is the largest Iron Age hill fort on the South Downs. Men moved by hand 30,000 tons of chalk to construct this place. These ramparts would have had 10 foot high wooden walls completely surrounding the entire fortress. But this wasn't a place of aggression. This was a place of protection. This was a place where the local farmers stored their foods from the raiding parties of other Iron Age tribes looking for easy pickings. And if the farmers had their food stolen, they would have starved. So they went to all of this trouble to protect their families and their livelihood and their land. But there is something else here that drew early man to the Downs, and it is pivotal to the history of Britain. Sisbury is also home to the remains of over 270 mines. It's probably one of the first industrial landscapes that we have in Britain. And a lot of people were going to a lot of trouble to find just one thing. Flint. A man was probably sitting on the banks of this pit 6,000 years ago, napping out arrowheads, spearheads, axes, knives, skinning tools. And these mines went down, some of them went down 12 meters. And underneath where I'm standing, there would have been shafts that fed into the ground horizontally uh, that were mined. They were dug out using antler horn. And most of those shafts probably, if they haven't caved in, still exist. They were after, not the first seam of flint in the ground or the second, but the third and the fourth and the fifth seam, because the flint was more workable. It was more malleable. And people would have come here to trade. Flints from here have been found as far afield as East Anglia. This was wealth. This was the gold of its day. Ever since Neolithic times, the South Downs has been shaped by people. Recent evidence from aerial surveys has found that prehistoric man was cultivating huge swathes of this land as far back as 3,000 years ago. 
The field systems, many of which are now covered by woods, suggest that there was a highly organized civilization in existence here. As old as ancient Egypt, could these verdant hills have been the ancient heart of Britain? Today, our relationship with the land continues to evolve. With its dry, chalky soil and more sunlight than anywhere else in Britain, a new industry is emerging on the downs. It's summer, and winemaker Peter Hall is hard at work at the Breaky Bottom Vineyard. It took my breath away when I came over the hill, because it was a sort of Wuthering Heights without the coldness. I did fall in the head of the hills in love with it straight away. <laughs> yeah. Peter arrived here 50 years ago. And I found a tiny cottage here. Derelict, broken windows. Um, and I asked the governor, could I live there? He said, there's no electricity, no telephone, just a standpipe for water outside. I said, that's all fine by me. So as a, whatever, 30 year old bachelor, I was able to come here and live here on my own and I loved it. Peter was one of the pioneers of the English winemaking industry in the 70s. And it's almost exclusively sparkling wine. Champagne method sparkling wine. Really what we've got is a um, very similar climate to Champagne, which is the northernmost region in France for growing grapes, and uh, similar geology and soil type. Well, these are Chardonnay, so they're the white grape from Champagne. These are predominantly the ones that are planted in the UK, along with Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, um, which are black grapes. All have white juice, of course, so your champagne is often a blend of all three of those, or a blend of two of them. Today, the South Downs has about 40 wine producers, and many are international award winners. I'm bottling before I harvest my next lot. They've had some sugar put in, so that, and some more yeast, and the yeast will say, wake up. So the alcohol will go up from about 11 to about 12.1, 12 12.2, 12 something like that. It's just what you want. And of course, you get huge pressure, six atmospheres of pressure uh, building up. So that is the real champagne. Now that's, yeah, it's wonderful. People have always been drawn to the South Downs. Many great writers and artists have been inspired by this place. Tennyson, Kipling, Hilaire Belloc, Jane Austen, just to name a few. And in the early 1900s, the Bloomsbury Group would gather for their early meetings in Charleston Farmhouse, which is just over that brow there. An influential group of writers, philosophers, and artists that included Virginia Woolf, her sister Vanessa Bell, and Duncan Grant. They painted everything they could get their hands on, the tables, the chairs, the piano. Their liberal attitude was a strong reaction to the strict Victorian view of the world that existed at the time. And their art reflected the softness, beauty, and intense femininity of these gently rolling hills. There is something in the light. There is something in the soil here that really just gives you a sense of freedom. And I think that is what attracted so many to this place. I was speaking to a man in Furl yesterday who used to live in London. And he said, I said, are you thinking about moving? And he said, no, they're going to have to carry me out of this place in a box. And that's how I feel about it. As I follow the South Downs Way west towards the middle of the park, much of the landscape turns to woodland. Just north of Chichester is Kingly Vale, one of Britain's most spectacular ancient woods. 
These yew trees are thought to be over 2,000 years old. Catherine Birch from Natural England is the reserve manager. So the yew trees were very special here, um, but you get these really gnarled, twisted, ancient shapes which create this sort of wild feeling to the place. People call this tree the octopus, reaching out with its arms and it's all sort of twisted and fluid and moving. It's really, it's one, probably one of my favourite trees on the reserve, it's really beautiful. And you can see the, the blood red where the bark comes away. This is just the, part of the natural coloration of the tree. And the story goes that there was a great battle with the Vikings and the men of Chichester came out and fought them. And um, the men of Chichester won the battle here and the Viking blood ran into the ground. And that blood now runs through the yew trees. And people do say the trees here come alive and move around at night. This is another male yew tree. And what's really special about this tree, which is known as the grandfather tree, is that you see how it's put a branch down and it's rooted itself back into the ground here and then produced another generation, the next generation. And then it's rooted itself again in the ground and produced another generation. So there's three generations all still attached to this original male tree. The male trees also produce pollen to fertilize the female ewes in the forest. Once a year, over just a few days, they release their pollen together. And Kingly Vale erupts in clouds of yellow smoke. A lot of the myths about the trees being immortal, and they live for such a long time, and they're slow growing, you can see why they're kind of associated with this eternal life. This ancient land throws up constant reminders of our past. Here, close to Chichester, the South Downs became a key area for the Roman invasion of Britain in 43 AD. And I'm standing on what would have been one of the first Roman roads to be built in the British Isles, Stane Street. And you can see Chichester basking in sunlight. And it's thought that Chichester Harbour was a key staging post for the Roman invasion of Britain and that this row would have supplied the Roman military machine as it marched north. This six kilometer section running through the National Trust's Linden Estate is one of the best preserved pieces of Roman road in the country. At its height, it would have been just under seven and a half meters wide. And this central section here, this was called the agger. And this would have taken the ox carts carrying the really heavy goods. On either side of the agger, there would have been two lanes for the lighter traffic, the horses and the pedestrians. But this was a major highway running from the harbor to London, carrying supplies, military equipment, and also food, cheese, parma ham, truffles, and wine. This whole area around Chichester became a very important stronghold for the Romans. Roman farms, houses, and palaces have all been unearthed around here. They also introduced brown hares and rabbits, pheasants and stinging nettles. 
soldiers were said to have flogged themselves with the nettles to stimulate blood flow and keep themselves warm in the cold northern winters. Centuries later, when William the Conqueror invaded England in 1066, many of the forests in this part of the Downs were declared royal hunting grounds for the Norman kings. And they remained a haven for wildlife for hundreds of years after. It was in these wooded downs in the 18th century that one of our greatest naturalists, Reverend Gilbert White, transformed our view of the natural world and how we see ourselves within it. His home was here in Selborne, close to the northern boundary of the park. He lived in the 1700s, well before Darwin, when nature was considered as something that should be ruled over, controlled and tamed. Gilbert White was the first to challenge that view. The original manuscript of the natural history and antiquities of Selborne and this writing these words have changed the world. Before Gilbert White, no one had written in detail about the natural world. No one had gone outside and sat down and looked and listened and been able from that to deduce the separation between species and the intimacies of genus. Gilbert White spent hours in these woods observing detail. He was the first to identify the differences between the willow warbler, the wood warbler, and the chiffchaff by their song. He identified the harvest mouse as a separate species. He must have been here at night because he identified the nocturnal bat as a separate species. Really, he laid the foundation stone for the study of natural history and the environmental movement as we know it today, to such an extent that Charles Darwin declared that he stood on the shoulders of Gilbert White. At the western end of the South Downs, the park fans out north across an area known as the Weald. It's a very different landscape with its own unique wildlife and history. Look at this. This is Black Downhill. It's the highest point in Sussex. And it's a part of the national park that I, I was completely unaware of. This habitat was created by meltwater from the last ice age, which has eroded all the chalk, just leaving clay and acidic green sand. And that has created this rare habitat called lowland heath. And the kings and the lords that own this land would have probably given it away, let it out um, to the locals to graze their cattle because the agricultural value here is pretty minimal. The name heathen actually stems from those who would have lived and worked on this land. Imagine what they must have been like. With its rare mix of dry heathland and ponds, this part of the Weald is of great value to wildlife. It is the only area in Britain that can claim to have all 12 native species of amphibians and reptiles. And just a couple of miles from here, on Marley Common, I'm hoping to find Britain's only venomous snake. Senior ranger Matt Bramich from the National Trust and biologist Lucy Struthers have been tagging and tracking the adders here for two years. 
We haven't caught this one before. Okay. So we're quite excited. Oh, yes. Is it female? Yeah. yeah. Oh, isn't she lovely? How old, how old do you think she is now? They can live up to uh, 30 years. I didn't know that. No. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, she will give birth in late August, September. Then she goes on a month-long feeding frenzy before retiring to hibernate. Typically, she'll be in the underground for six months. Wow. Mm. Once the tag is on, what information are you hoping to garner? This year, I'm hoping to establish where they go to post-breeding. That would be a really important thing for, for us as, as land managers to know about. The adders travel between their feeding and breeding areas on the pockets of heathland across the wheel. By understanding where they're going, Matt hopes to better protect them and the wildlife corridors they need to maintain a healthy population. Very neat. In Australia, I saw a snake on the ground, and I said to the guy, you know, what happens if that bites you? And he said, if that one bites you, just sit down and have a smoke. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to go. It's time for her to go back to her world now. So I'm just going to put her down. There she goes. Oh, is that beautiful? With its thick clay and acid soils, the weald was of little value to man and it remained sparsely inhabited for thousands of years. But that changed in the 16th century when something of great value was found in the ground. Time has a way of hiding histories. Looking out here, it's hard to imagine that during the 16th century, this was a hive of activity. There are three things here that are critical to the beginning of the iron industry in Britain. First of all, there was water to drive the bellows. Secondly, there was wood for charcoal. And lastly, this is the most important ingredient. This is iron ore. And it was probably dug up no more than three miles away from here. Right here at the Fernhurst Furnace and on 15 other sites in the Western Weald, this was the place that seeded the Industrial Revolution. It produced the best iron in the country, where the cannon were made that defeated the Armada, from the water in the pond and charcoal from the trees and this little beauty from the ground. I'm standing on what would have been the furnace. In front of me, there would have been two huge water wheels, and they would have powered two massive 15-foot bellows feeding air into the bottom of this furnace to generate the heat needed to melt the iron ore. And this went on 24 hours a day for well over 200 years. Nearby, just eight miles to the east on Ebono Common, the heathland of the Weald mixes with woodland to create one of the richest habitats in Europe. In the open forest where sunlight reaches the ground, there's an incredible diversity of plants and insects. Fungus runs rampant in the warm and often damp glades, and fallen trees rot more quickly. It provides the perfect food for the grubs of creatures like this rare hornet beetle. The beetle lays its eggs in the dead wood. Its stripes and jerky movements are thought to mimic the hornet it's named after and ward off potential predators. The trees also provide shelter for some creatures that only emerge after dark. Ebono Common is a world hotspot for bats. 
An amazing 15 of the 18 species of bats found in Britain live here, including the very rare Beckstein and Barberstel bats. One of the UK's leading bat experts, Steph Murphy, has been tracking them for more than 10 years. Using this fine net, she has a few minutes to catch, tag, and release them, so any stress is kept to a minimum. So this is um, a lovely female barber style. Aren't they beautiful? They almost look quite pug-faced. Yeah. Um, so the ears um, join at the base, and so that's quite an identifying feature, as we can see. She has had a baby this year, so she's got a dependent young at the moment, so you can see she's quite clearly lactating. And they're quite a dark, blackish colour. They are, they're dark. When were they first discovered here? It was about 2000. Extraordinary. But, I mean, how long have they been here before then? Oh, probably before we were. I mean, I just <laughs> find, I find that so wonderful that yeah. in the year 2000, we make a discovery like this. Yes, here. yeah. Why Epilocal? Well, in this part of, of Sussex, it's quite a unique wooded landscape. It's connected across the South Downs that provides lots of roosting habitat, foraging habitat. You, you, have, you have everything in one landscape. It's not disturbed. How far away are they feeding They birds? have been recorded up to 25 kilometres. They go quite a distance. So they're flying 25 yes. kilometres out and it's, back every night. They're doing a 50-mile round trip. It's pretty, 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 trip. pretty yeah. um, extraordinary for a small bat to do that. So habitat connectivity such as tree lines and hedgerows and watercourses are very important and enable these bats to navigate from their roost sites to their feeding grounds. Of course. Fitting the bat with a tiny transmitter, Steph hopes to learn more about where they're roosting and protect their breeding sites. OK. So she needs to fly now. She needs to fly now. She's, um, yeah, and right. I think she's probably quite hungry. There you go. There we are. Whoa. There she is. And there's the tawny owl on cue. Absolutely. <laughs> a lot of people get freaked out by being oh, in no. Wizard Night. It's much scarier being in Central Brighton on a Friday night than a... <laughs> uh, 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 well, let's just call them different environments. <laughs> <laughs> well, what an amazing night to see the barbastrals, to see that they're breeding, um, to see them alive and healthy and flying. What a privilege. What a privilege. Across the South Downs Park, summer is drawing to a close. The farmers are bringing in the last of the crops. With more than 80% of the park now farmed, the wild areas that remain and the corridors that connect them are not just important refuges for wildlife. They're also important to people and have been for thousands of years. It's the last week of September. In the morning, the grass is heavy with dew. The leaves are beginning to change color and the bushes are ripe with haws and elderberries, sloes and damsons. I'm here to meet Lucinda Warner, who's a herbalist and who knows every flower and berry and leaf on the damson. Today, she's gathering berries from hawthorns. Uh, here on the downs, we get lots of these beautiful lone hawthorns. It buries so profusely and um, yeah, it's full of these wonderful starches that would have been so important for our ancestors. Like starch was one of the hardest uh, foods, those kind of staples for them to come across. Well, I think there's actually a massive, a massive resurgence in interest in foraging and herbal medicine and wild foods. And I think a lot of that is because, I mean, you, you can see just being out here that the, the medicine is not just in the taking of the substance. It's in, it's in the picking, it's in the harvesting, it's, it's in the being with the plants. The whole process becomes, becomes the medicine, really. We've got so many beautiful plants here. We're so lucky in the, in the downs that we have so many wildflowers growing on the chalk. Yarrow is a really great example of that. And then we've also got self-heal here. This one's mm. gone past flowering now, but... Uh -huh. 
just the name, the fact that our ancestors chose to call it Self-Heal, uh, says how much it was valued, really. And so to our ancestors, this was a medicine chest, essentially. Absolutely. I mean, everything had a use, it had a sacredness, some for food, some for medicine, some for tinder, some for shelter. Mm. Um, I think, you know, today we talk very much about um, this idea of reconnecting with nature, mm. but I think to, to our ancestors that would have been a laughable notion because we <laughs> would, the idea that we weren't nature yeah. would have been a completely alien one. Across the downs, autumn takes hold. For wine grower Peter Hall, it's time to pick the grapes. We've had such good sunshine this summer. Um, this is the culmination of one of the best years I've ever, I've ever known, actually. Yeah, I think if you're... Oh, hello. No, I take all the help as it comes. We must have maybe nearly 20 people picking today. Now, I think we do need another bucket. Don't you think? So, but I, it's a wonderful atmosphere. Well, someone, I mean, Richard has been with me since the start. In fact, I went to school with Richard. We never argued, did we? No, no, never. Never fall out. I'm going to turn the press. We have the support of uh, friends and family, and uh, we don't pay them, but we give them a really nice lunch. And that's an important part of why they come, actually. <laughs> it's, this sort of lifts your spirits that such nice people come, and they help you. And then they feel part of the, the wine as well. And, you know, they use it in their own lives because they might use it for their weddings or their christenings. We're so small, but we're an important part of this community. We, uh, we love each other. I say with a full smile and uh, we work well as a team. Uh, without that, I think it would be impossible. Yeah, impossible to work. As winter draws near, the first storms roll in, battering the Seven Sisters. Every three years, almost a meter of these cliffs are taken by the waves as they reclaim this ancient seabed. Winter visitors start to arrive. Buick swans fly in more than 2,500 miles from Siberia. They'll overwinter in the flooded river valleys. Short-eared owls arrive from their breeding grounds as far away as Scandinavia and Iceland. They'll stay here for six months, hunting for mice and voles along the hedgerows. Forests, woodsmen coppice hazel and birch for fencing, intimate charcoal, keeping the forest open for wildlife to flourish. On the chalk grasslands in the eastern downs, rangers and volunteers turn to clearing the scrub keeping the woods at bay, just as it has been done since Neolithic times, 7,000 years ago. The South Downs is a landscape that has been shaped by people, and it has in turn shaped the people that have lived here. For me, it is without doubt one of the most beautiful landscapes that I know. And as life turns inwards across its rolling hills, the words of one of the Downland's greatest poets, Hilaire Belloc, echo.
in my ears. If I ever become a rich man, or if ever I grow to be old, I will build a house with deep thatch to shelter me from the cold. And there shall the Sussex songs be sung and the story of Sussex told. I will hold my house in the high wood within a walk of the sea. And the men that were boys when I was a boy shall sit and drink with me. As winter takes grip, the first snows begin to fall. In my local, it's folk night. Some of the downland songs date back to Saxon times. Their music and words passed on through the ages. As the winter snow and rain seeps into the chalk, hundreds of springs across the downs come to life. They flow into several rivers that have carved valleys through the South Downs. As water levels rise, the rivers spill across the floodplains, creating some of the most important wetlands in Northern Europe. In the Aran Valley, Buick swans with their distinctive yellow beaks spend the winter grazing on water plants and grass. In the western downs, the springs flow out across the chalklands to create a very different kind of river. Here is the source of two very special rivers. The Rother which begins at the base of Grandfather's Bottom just there, and the Mion on the other side of the valley. Fed by springs all year round, the Mion flows a short 21 miles down into the Solent. Its clear waters are under pressure from fertilizer and farm waste that leach into the river. But Nick Heesman of the South Downs National Park Authority has been working with the local community to clean it up. The rain comes down on top of those downs, it filters through that chalk, and it comes out purified by the chalk, and then we end up with crystal clear. They call this Jing clear water. Some hydrologists think that some of this water passing, coming past us now in the river, might have fallen 60 years ago. It has oh. taken all that time to filter through the rock. I didn't know that. And this gives rise to an amazing amount of biodiversity. By reducing pollution and widening the river edge habitat, the community has encouraged more birds to return and fish stocks to improve. And in recent years, a very special creature has come back to the meal. Waterfowl have returned. So um, we've been involved with the largest waterfowl reintroduction uh, in the UK. It's been brilliant. After being wiped out locally by the American mink, the park has been working with the community to release more than 300 water bowls back into the river. So we've enhanced the habitat, we've been controlling the American mink, and we've seen the water bowl return in really good numbers. And actually, this is really good water bowl habitat here. That's really good. good. Like everything they need right here. Beautiful. Beautiful. After an absence of 20 years, the river is also seeing the return of one of Britain's rarest predators. Assistant ranger Laura Dean has set up remote cameras to film several platforms along the river. We have currently seven wildlife cameras out in the river now. Yeah. Um, 
And this is only oh, the last No. <laughs> That's extraordinary. They've captured the first footage of otters in the South Downs for more than 20 years. So the otters use the mink rafts to spring on? Yes. To uh, sort of set out their territory. Yes. So a lot of these images are either the otters sprinting or smelling other, other otters that have sprinted on them. It's just so lovely to see them, to know that they're here. Definitely, yes. We've got breeding otter with cubs. Fantastic. This year, um, they've returned to the rother. We've had the first recorded evidence for a long time on the rother. That's really fantastic. exciting news. That's fantastic. Because we'd, we'd expect it here on the Mian, but to get it on the rother, mm. that means that we can start seeing them move right across the rivers yeah, of to course. the east of the downs. Of course. Hopefully see them on the Cookmead. You know? Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> Last hill. On the other side of the brow of this hill, St. Catherine's Hill, at the western edge of the park, the South Downs Way runs into Winchester. Journey's end. The ancient capital of England. And it was here that Alfred in the ninth century had Latin texts translated into English. And through his educational reforms, he fostered the birth of the English language, which was instrumental in tying the nation together. The South Downs is seared into our psyche. I love this land. The land that I found over the last year, this land of silver rivers, this land of winding sheep tracks across the faces of escarpments. This land that has a wealth of butterflies, a wealth of wildflowers. But most of all, what I've learned is that this land has been formed by many different peoples. And you can see their influence through history through the landscape, which they clearly loved in every single aspect of this extraordinary national park. Long may it thrive. Long may it be a place of welcome. And long may it be a haven for all life, human and natural.